Hello, this is Chris McGrath of TDN, welcoming you to the next instalment of the Life's Work Project, partnering with Keeneland and the University of Kentucky's Nunn Center for Oral History. We're so lucky that some of the most accomplished figures in our industry have agreed to share some memories of their lives and careers and the great horses they've encountered. And today, it's an honor to have been invited to the home of a wonderful man and wonderful horseman, Mr. John Williams. Arthur Hancock, who is uh, arguably a, one of the top horsemen we have here in the bluegrass. I mean, he has certainly established that. He had, he, he, he said something to me once, Chris, he said, you know, when you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he had some help. Well, I want to tell you, this turtle had plenty of help because look where I started, you know, and wound up managing a, an, an enterprise like Spendthrift and then being able to do uh, uh, be, be a breeder on my own too. I mean, a groom at Bowie Racetrack, this shouldn't have happened. And the only reason it happened is because I got a lot of help on the way up. This is April 5th, 1966. And I was a groom for Helmore Farm. And here I am for the first time standing in the winter circle. The most important person to the horse um, is not, not the trainer, not the owner, as ridiculous as that sounds, but his groom who lives with him. In my, my case, the horses that I groomed on the racetrack, um, I love being with them. I love being with some more than others, but I love being with all of them. Uh, there was a dapper horse trainer named uh, Senor Horatio Loro, or Horatio, and he was a dapper guy. He cocked that hat just right, you know, and he had that presence. And my wife, Benny, would sure remember him, you know. And he brought this diminutive colt in there. And uh, they used to say he was 15 two hands high. He'd need elevator shoes to be 15 two. He was just a little piece of a horse. He brought this little colt in and uh, he belonged to uh, Edward P. Taylor from uh, Ontario. Uh, and the reason Mr. Taylor still had this horse is because when he was presented uh, at public auction, he failed to meet his reserve, which I believe was $25,000. And this little colt's name was Northern Dancer. He proceeded to win uh, the second jewel of the Triple Crown in 1964 for the dapper Horatio Doro. And then all of us that have ever been in the thoroughbred business and weren't comatose know exactly the influence that this horse has had on our breed. Seattle Slough, maybe the most brilliant racehorse that I've ever seen. Pure speed, just brilliant. Um, you talk about a horse outrunning his pedigree. My God, there's the there's the benchmark for that statement. He was unbelievable, undefeated triple, uh, undefeated uh, two-year-old, you know, undefeated triple crown winner, uh, horse of the year, uh, amazing horse. So he was syndicated, he came to Spanthrift, and I won't belabor a lot of the details, but I, after the first uh, week, I had to make a, another phone call and I called Mickey Taylor and I said, Mickey, we have a problem. He said, what is it? I said, he doesn't like girls. That's $12 million stud horse. He was worth every bit of the gray hair that he put in my head. Think about what he did in his first two crops. Can you imagine? That was, that was some horse. That was Mr. Seattle Slew. And I actually galloped him a few times. The last time I did, I said, I'll never do this again. I thought he was going to kill me. 
everything in life, it's the little, the, the details, but the little things as it deals with the horse. And as they said, you can't do enough for the horse. You know, he feeds you. So I keep it there. Look at that smile on Edgar Lucas's face. If he'd have won the Oaks, he couldn't have had a more broad smile. This reminds me of not who I was, but who I am. I'm just a groom that had a good shot.